Uh, welcome again to the Royal Society for Asian Affairs. It's a pleasure to have such a large and widely dispersed audience for our talk today and I would like particularly to welcome those joining us from a range of Gulf countries from Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan, India, Pakistan, Singapore, Hong Kong and Zimbabwe and we have of course many friends also from across Europe, the United States and the UK. We're delighted to have you all with us. We've received many messages of encouragement and support over the last three months and I would like to thank all of you who have written to us so warmly about this series. It is greatly appreciated by everyone involved. These webinars will continue every week until the end of this month, by which time we will have delivered almost as many events in four months as the Society has traditionally run in a whole year. We're then taking August off, but we will be back in September when, among other things, we will hold our first online annual general meeting. Now, returning to today, the great game, a construct of 19th and early 20th century British strategists to explain what they thought or feared was happening in Central Asia certainly had the benefit of stimulating the foundation of this society. Uh, whether that construct has any other merit is less clear as we are going to hear from today's speaker, Dr. Alexander Morrison. Alexander Morrison is a fellow and tutor in history at New College, Oxford. He was previously a Provise Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, lecturer in Imperial History at the University of Liverpool and Professor of History at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. He's the author of Russian Rule in Samarkand, 1868 to 1910, A Comparison with British India, published in 2008, and has just completed a history of the Russian conquest of Central Asia for Cambridge University Press, which will appear later this year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alexander Morrison. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. So I hope you can all see my screen. Um, thank you all very much for, for joining us for today's talk and uh, apologies perhaps to some of you for the slightly provocative nature um, of the title. Although in fact, I'm not the first person to refer to the great game um, as a myth. Uh, the great historian of uh, Anglo-Indian foreign policy, um, Malcolm Yap, uh, also um, has a lecture entitled The Myth of the Great Game. Um, Yap's emphasis was really upon how the British understood um, the defense of India. My emphasis is very much on the Russian side of the story. Um, I've spent the last, well, longer than I care to remember actually, but at least the last 10 years um, working in archives in, in Russia, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, um, in Georgia, uh, and in India. Um, looking for materials to um, explain what I see as one of the 19th century's most important, most dramatic examples of uh, imperial expansion, which is the Russian conquest of, of Central Asia, uh, which added about one and a half million square miles of territory and about six million people uh, to um, the Russian Empire and, of course, subsequently to the Soviet Union. Um, I have quite a lot of material to get through in, in this talk. The book on which it's based um, it looks as if it's going to weigh in at something like eight or nine hundred pages. So <laughs> um, I'm going to um, have to skirt quite a lot of um, fairly complex topics and I'm going to highlight a few case studies that are taken from it. I can't talk about every single campaign of conquest. Um, I wanted to start with just um, some very general remarks um, about the political geography of Central Asia before um, and during the conquest. Um, so this is a very um, rough outline map um, taken from Yuri Bregel's um, atlas, um, which gives a sense of the political divisions that existed in Central Asia before uh, the Russians conquered it um, in the course of the 19th century. Um, you'll see in the northern part um, uh, the three hordes of the Kazakhs, the junior, middle and senior hordes. Uh, you will see um, uh, the sort of sprawling shape of the Kokan Khanate, which um, was based in the Fergana Valley but extended up um, along the Sea Daria. Um, into the steppe and into other regions populated by Kazakhs. You have the Bukharan Emirate next to that um, in the Zarafshan Valley, and you have the Khanate of Khiva um, in the Khorezm oasis south of the Aral Sea. We then have territory uh, adjacent to those populated by um, uh, nomadic Kyrgyz and Turkmen. Um, now the dotted lines on this map do not indicate anything uh, resembling modern frontiers, and that's actually quite an important point um, because one of the things that I argue throughout the book 
um, is that um, the Russians and Central Asian peoples had very differing ideas of sovereignty, very differing ideas of statehood um, uh, uh, from each other, and that this was one of the factors that helped to um, prompt um, uh, a fairly relentless Russian advance throughout the, uh, that period. So this um, is a very schematic um, outline of the um, uh, sort of the progress of the of the Russian conquest at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the effective limits of Russian control and Russian sovereignty ran along a series of fortified lines um, in the northern steppe, uh, the Orenburg, um, uh, Presnogorskaya, and Irtysh um, lines, um, not actually that different from the modern frontier between um, Russia and Kazakhstan. Um, in the course of the 1820s and 1830s, the Russians began building a series of uh, so-called prikazi um, or uh, administrative centers deeper into the steppe to try to control um, the junior and middle horde Kazakhs. One of these was uh, Akmolinsk, which today, of course, well, today, in fact, is Nur Sultan, but I'm afraid I can't really bring myself to think of it as such. The city I lived in for three and a half years was very definitely called Astano. Um, then uh, in the 1840s and 1850s, you have this very decisive move much deeper into Central Asia. Um, first uh, in the west from Orenburg uh, down to the Sirdaria um, with the capture of the uh, fortress of Akmazjid, later Perovsk, today Kizlorda from the Kopan Khanate uh, in 1853 and almost simultaneously um, in the east uh, from western Siberia down along what is now the Kazakhstan-China frontier towards what was then called Fort Vyernaya, which is modern Almaty, which was founded in 1854. Um, now, this phase of the Russian conquests, I found, actually usually gets left out of the existing historiography. People usually date the beginning of the conquests from 1865, uh, which is the year when Tashkent fell to Russian forces under General uh, Mikhail Grigorievich uh, Chernyayev. Um, but as we can see, um, we do actually need to explain how the Russians came to be in the vicinity of Tashkent by the 1860s. Uh, given that this is almost a thousand miles to the south um, of um, their frontier at the beginning of the century. So quite a large part of my book actually focuses on those um, earlier phases of expansion in the 1840s uh, and 1850s. Um, subsequently, you have campaigns fought by the Russians against the Emirate of Bukhar and the Khanate of Khiva, which lead to annexation of territory from those two um, polities and um, the transformation of both of them into Russian protectorates, very similar to the princely states of British India. Uh, in the 1870s, you have an often overlooked campaign in the Fergana Valley, which destroys what's left of the Kokan Khanate um, and annexes uh, those territories uh, to Russia. Uh, and then you have the final phase of expansion in the 1880s and early 1890s, which takes in the Turkmen territories um, and uh, the Pamir region uh, of what is now um, Tajikistan. Uh, and it's um, in 1895, with the creation of the Pamir boundary, that um, uh, the southern frontier of the Russian Empire assumes um, the form which obviously we, which which still exists today, although of course now it's the frontier of various um, independent countries. So that is a long and complicated story and as I've indicated I can't tell all of it today, um, but I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about how this uh, very rapid, very dramatic um, process of imperial expansion has been explained by historians in the past. So I'm not going to name names here, although I can, of course, do so if, you, if you're interested once we get um, onto the questions at the end. So the historiography of the Russian conquest, um, I think, is generally quite unsatisfactory. I suppose I would say that, um, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have written such an old book um, um, about it. Um, we have the notion of uh, what I call the cotton canard. So this is the idea that the fall of Tashkent and the subsequent conquests of the oasis regions of Central Asia comes about as a result of lobbying by the Russian textile manufacturing interest, seeking both a, so a secure source of raw cotton and a captive market for manufactured goods. And that's an economic explanation which ultimately derives from uh, Lenin's works, from imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. It's very much associated with Soviet historiography. And what you also get in Soviet historiography um, is a narrative of prisoidinini, or uniting. So um, this holds that Central Asia had not actually been conquered at all, it had been uh, peacefully united to Russia, and the Russian people had played, then played a politically progressive role in raising the peoples of Central Asia to political consciousness. Um, you have the notion in some of the Anglophone historiography of uh, an accidental conquest, um, that you had amb ambitious and aggressive officers on the frontier 
Uh, this is a quotation from the diary of Pyotr Valuyev, Minister of the Interior at the time when Tashkent fell, uh, that Tashkent has been taken by General Chenyaev. No one knows why and for what. There is something erotic, nichto erotichiske, about everything we do on the far-flung periphery of the empire. Um, and um, that certainly found some traction, um, particularly in historiography produced in the English-speaking world in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and owes something perhaps to Schumpeterian ideas of imperialism as a sort of atavistic um, uh, throwback um, um, uh, undertaken by militarized aristocratic um, elites. And then finally, of course, we have um, the explanation that has generally been so pop most popular in, in the English speaking world, which is that of the great game, that the annexation of Central Asia by Russia needs to be seen from the perspective of the defense of India, that the whole purpose of this massive uh, acquisition of territory and peoples is to threaten the British in India um, and to secure diplomatic and military advantages by putting pressure on Britain um, on uh, this supposedly sort of vulnerable um, spot in her global empire. Well, I think there are problems with all of these interpretations. Um, some are more fundamental than others. Um, uh, if we look at um, the Cotton Canard thesis, well, I think we can dismiss that um, out of hand. It simply doesn't work chronologically. Um, the conquest of Central Asia began at the latest in 1839 uh, with the winter expedition to Hiva under General Pirovsky, which I will talk about a little bit in a moment. Uh, this had been discussed since the early 1800s, uh, well before Russia even had a significant textile industry. Um, and the notion that Moscow's industrialized, uh, industrial elites had this sort of influence over the Russian state is, is fundamentally very far-fetched. Um, the pre soedinian narrative, well, it's hardly an appropriate term for a process that involves so much violence. And the notion that certain events or processes in history are inherently progressive is a value judgment based on Marxist-Leninist dogma, which really we shouldn't have much time for. Um, the idea that the conquest is purely accidental, um, it's not completely without merit. There certainly are episodes in it which are the result of the initiative of the man on the spot. But in the end, it, it trivializes the whole process and it can be used to absolve the Russians of actually having any imperialist aims. It's, it all becomes a, a little bit like the idea that Britain acquired its, its empire in a fit of absence of mind with no real purpose or goals behind it. Uh, and it's just not borne out by the documentary record. For almost every stage of the Russian advance, you can find a paper trail which leads from Orenburg or from Omsk or from Tiflis through the war ministry and the foreign ministry and back up to the Tsar himself. And finally, the great game. Well, in many ways, I think that's the most flawed of all of these explanations. Um, it sees the conquest almost exclusively through British eyes using British sources. Um, and it reflects British obsessions and paranoia. It doesn't tell us anything about what the Russians themselves thought they were up to. Um, so the British may have assumed that Russian, the Russian advance was directed at their rule in India, but there's no reason to believe that the Russians themselves intended this. Um, my, perhaps my strongest objection to it is it really marginalizes local rulers and people. So if we look at this simply as a great power competition, um, well, we are robbing um, Central Asians themselves of any agency, any involvement, really any importance in this story at all. It all becomes about um, Britain and Russia, and the Central Asians just sort of form a kind of picturesque backdrop uh, to this story. Um, if you look at Russian archival sources, you find that they're much more concerned about their relations with Central Asian peoples, whether this is the um, Kazakh confederations, um, uh, the Kyrgyz, um, uh, the Turkmen, or the three Central Asian Khanates, uh, than they are with the British. The British figure actually quite marginally in Russian decision-making processes. They don't really talk about them all that much. Um, or rather, when they do, um, uh, it's much more as um, an example to emulate uh, rather than um, uh, a particularly sort of deadly um, or existential rival. And that's a theme I shall come back to. So why did the Russians conquer Central Asia? Well, um, without wanting to replace all of those, I think, flawed narratives with um, another overarching one, my, my feeling is that the, the initial impulse comes from a sense of competitive emulation with other European powers. So we can identify a number of events on the steppe frontier in the early 19th century, which make the Russians think, okay, we need to exercise more control over what is going on beyond our fortified lines in the Northern steppe. Um, these might be caravan raiding, um, the capturing of slaves um, uh, from Russian territory and they're carrying off to Hiva in particular, um, 
uh, general sort of um, disorder as the Russians saw it. Um, the point is that all of this, of course, had been taking place in the 18th century as well. Um, in fact, the step was a lot more turbulent in the 18th century. In the 1770s, for instance, you have the Bukhachov rebellion, which almost actually um, destroys the Russian state. It's a much more serious affair than anything that's happening in the early 19th century. So what's changed then is Russian attitudes towards this. They're not, no longer willing to tolerate um, this kind of behavior. So rebellions on the steppe, attacks on caravans, defiance from petty Central Asian states, all of these come to seem intolerable to Russia's ruling elites after Russia's victory over Napoleon made her one of just two global powers after 1815. The other, of course, being um, Britain. Um, and this is reflected very much in, the, in, a, in forms of language that actually recur all the time when the Russians, uh, with remarkable consistency actually, when the Russians are talking about Central Asians and why they have a problem with them. Uh, one word that comes up over and over again is dierska, which um, uh, means insolent um, in Russian. Uh, Central Asian peoples and states were seen as insolent and that insolence could not be tolerated if Russia's great power status was to be maintained. So Britain is important as a point of reference, as a point of comparison, um, as uh, a power whose um, uh, um, trade networks um, and whose uh, territorial conquests in Asia uh, was something um, to be admired and emulated. Uh, France is actually also important. So as we'll see when General Perovsky, um, the governor of Orenburg, um, is arguing for action against Hiva, uh, he invokes the French annexation of Algiers um, in 1830. So this isn't really direct competition for territory or influence. As we'll see, the British and the Russians only really come into sort of direct contact with each other right towards the end of this process. Um, it's much more a, a fear of falling, a fear of seeing imperial prestige damaged in the eyes of European rivals or those of so-called Asiatics. Um, so to take an example, this is a memorandum from uh, uh, 1824, uh, sorry, from 1826 uh, by Major General Verigin, who was the chief quartermaster in Orenburg, which exemplifies this, this way of thinking very clearly. After the Rus wonderful victory achieved by Russia in 1812 and the following years over the enemies of the whole of Europe, it seemed that all people should have a proper sense of the terrible strength of her mightiness and fear to arouse her righteous wrath. But notwithstanding all these hopes, on the contrary, we see that close to the boundaries of our realm, the insignificant but perfidious heathen people have dared once again to raise an armed force, force to attack one of our commercial caravans dispatched to Bukhara in 1824. So Virigin makes that explicit link between the, the victory in 1812 uh, and the behavior of Central Asians. Um, but you'll find it sort of in, in implicitly um, in a lot of other uh, documents as well. Um, here we have uh, Perovsky making a successful argument in January 1835 to be allowed to launch uh, a long distance expedition um, against Kiva. Um, and I found, um, I found the comparison that he makes here with the Algerian case really fascinating. Uh, the guilt of the day of Algiers against the king of the French pales into insignificance in comparison with the crimes carried out by whole generations of heathen Khans against the emperors of Russia. There a single momentary and in reality bloodless insult to the consul, here in the course of a whole century constantly accumulating perfidy which increases day by day, deliberate malice, robbery, banditry and disrespectful abuse of majesty, here the blood of Russians is spilled, has been flowing for a whole century, thousands have suffered and suffer now under the yoke of slavery. Um, now, Pirovsky was um, actually fought at the Battle of Borodino himself. Um, uh, he was very much alive to Russia's um, uh, prestige. He was very sensitive about it in a way. Um, and that kind of reasoning comes through you know, whenever he's writing actually about relations with Kiva. Um, do the British figure at all in this decision-making process? Well, they do a bit, but actually again, more as, um, uh, more as an example. Um, I would say. So here we see, um, uh, this is in 1839, um, the uh, um, Foreign Committee, which is, um, Foreign Affairs Committee, which is considering Perovsky's proposal for an expedition against Kiva, is considering the implications for this of the concurrent uh, British invasion or East India Company invasion of Afghanistan, which took place that year. Um, as we can see, they made the decision to attack Kiva well before um, they knew that the British were going to um, attack Afghanistan. Um, 
But they do say here, beyond its principal, its stated principal aim, it must have another still more important to establish and consolidate the influence of Russia in Central Asia, weaken the long-standing impunity of the Kievans, and especially that constancy with which the English government, to the detriment of our industry and trade, strives to spread its supremacy in those parts. However, bringing into consideration the current state of affairs in Central Asia, we consider it more convenient to postpone the mission to Kiva until the end of the expedition undertaken by the Governor General of the British possessions in India against the ruler of Kabul, Dost Muhammad. So what they're saying here really is that, um, and this is something that recurs again, is um, let's avoid provoking the British too openly because it might cause unnecessary complications. And actually that's what you tend to get from the foreign ministry in Russia um, throughout the 19th century, a general desire to avoid confrontation. There are occasional uh, uh, exceptions to that, um, usually when the British themselves are being unusually aggressive in Central Asia, namely at the times of the first and second uh, Anglo-Afghan wars. Another interesting point is that um, although the Russians, as I'll explain, did not get to Khiva, um in 1839-1840, um, their plan, if they had done, was modelled on what the British had done in Afghanistan. In other words, they wanted to install a puppet ruler of their own, uh, and they made that comparison explicit. They said, well, look, if, if, if the British can do it with Shah Shuja, then we can do it with our chosen candidate. They wanted to put a, a sort of puppet Chinggisid uh, on the throne um, in Hiva instead. So again, we have that sense of, of emulation, that this is what great powers do. Um, so the Hiva expedition fails. I can't go into too much detail as to why that was, but the basic reason is that um, it's one of the coldest winters anybody can remember, and most of the camels that are used for the expedition die. Um, now, this is one of my favorite um, um, illustrations, actually, re relating to the whole of the Russian conquest, because it actually demonstrates what all of this ultimately relied upon, because in this part of the world, um, the only way in which you could move around was using camels. Um, and this imposes all kinds of interesting structural constraints on the, on, on, on the possibilities of campaigning, basically. The Russians have a, have a very clear technological um, and sort of disciplinary advantage over their Central Asian opponents, but it's extremely difficult for them to get to grips with them. Um, because of the problems that the Central Asian steppe and its deserts present um, uh, in terms of mobility. Um, if they want to send an expedition into the steppe, then they need camels. Uh, the ratio actually is something like, uh, so for the, the Hiva expedition, which has 5,000 men, they need 10,000 camels. Uh, so you need at least two camels for every man. Uh, those camels have to be bred and recruited from and managed by Kazakhs. The Russians are not capable of... Um, producing camels themselves. So this throws them into an interesting relationship of dependence upon Central Asian nomads. And that's a theme that recurs over and over again. Uh, and I think it's very, very important um, to actually understand the conquest properly. You have to understand its logistics, which are very complex, very time consuming, very expensive. It takes them 18 months to round up all of these camels for this expedition. Um, and that underlines, I think, another point, um, which is that we can't really see this as something that is spontaneous or accidental um, if most of the campaigns, certainly the ones that um, have to cross steppe or desert, require so many months of planning, require such a large budget actually for baggage animals um, and of course for supplies. All of these things have to be approved in St. Petersburg. So if you open a, a typical archival file relating to one of these expeditions, the bulk of it is actually taken up with, with budgeting. Uh, with requests for funds which had to be sent to the place in question uh, usually in silver uh, because the Kazakhs wisely would not accept Russian paper money um, and um, uh, St. Petersburg in the end has to sign off on this indeed the Tsar has to sign off on it so his signature will usually be there on the cover of the file saying you know, uh, let it be done um, so the notion that this is a sort of process of adventurism that simply gets out of hand doesn't hold water uh, certainly not for this um, for the stages of the conquest that take place in the 1840s uh, and 1850s. Um, and um, I may come back to camels again later in the talk, but this is something to bear in mind. Um, this is really very, very important. It's as important really as, as any of the sort of higher level military or diplomatic decision making, which um, I, I may focus on um, subsequently. So um, Pirovsky's expedition fails. He writes this letter to his friend um, Bulgakov, um, in um, um, uh, in, 18, in, the, in the winter of 1840, when it's clear, in fact, that the expedition um, has, has failed. Um, 
And uh, I was very struck by this phrase because it, I think, summarizes quite well this combination of rivalry and emulation that we see in the relationship with Britain. Um, ici, il faut agir en anglais, et cela d'autant plus que c'est contre les anglais qu'on agit. Here we must act in the English manner, or as the English do, all the more so because it is against the English that we are acting. Um, but, um, uh, and by in the English manner, or as the English do, he means as basically sort of aggressive imperialists. Um, but this is, a, this is the sort of competition that we are um, engaged in. Um, we see again in this um, um, letter from Karl Nesselroder, uh, the Russian foreign minister at this time, uh, similar sorts of themes about the desire for um, respect um, from Central Asian peoples. Um, without wishing to impose Russian garrisons on them, we must and we wish to maintain a respect for our power. And this with the aim of putting our frontier in a state of tranquility to contain in obedience the Kyrgyz and other nomadic tribes who are habituated to living from rapine and brigandage to open at last outlets for our industry and assuring the free passage of caravans which sustain our commercial communications of Central Asia. So again, Nesselrode is stressing uh, this need for a stable frontier. Uh, and this is something that the Russians will be seeking um, for much of the 19th century um, in Central Asia uh, and failing um, to find. So I'm going to jump a little bit now from the um, Hever expedition um, to um, talking about uh, the situation in the 1850s um, and 1860s and the run-up uh, to the uh, conquest of Tashkent. Uh, in 1853, um, as I mentioned, the Russians took um, the Kokandi fortress of Akmazjid. Um, they renamed it Fort Perovsky. They turned it into the center of what they called the Sirdaria line. This is an attempt to create a new frontier uh, uh, along the Sirdaria um, in the heart of the Central Asian steppe. For reasons I don't have time to go into, this doesn't work. Um, basically, it's too expensive. The garrison morale is too low. They can't collect enough revenue from this region. Um, they have problems with supplies and, and so on. Um, so by the, um, uh, 18, by the um, early 1860s then, uh, they are starting to look further south. Um, and this is really the origin of the capture of Tashkent in 1865, that great turning point in the Russian advance into Central Asia, one which is often um, portrayed either as prompted by the, the cotton drought uh, provoked by the American Civil War or as a result of the disobedience of General Chernyayev, but actually it's embedded in a much uh, uh, more long-standing debate about how to create a secure frontier in Central Asia, one that will not require, um, uh, will not require sort of such a precarious and long distance um, supply network. So um, General Bezak, um, who was the governor of Orenburg at that time, is arguing in the um, upper quote, which I won't read out at length, that um, they need to advance further south, they need to advance into regions where there's a sedentary population, where there's higher grain productivity, where there is wood available, um, uh, and that um, it's the region between Turkestan and Tashkent um, that the Russians need to be um, looking at. Um, Tashkent is also an important uh, trading entrepreneur. Entrepre this is something else that he, uh, he says is, is, is a potential sort of benefit to its capture. As we can see from the quote below from his counterpart in Omsk in Western Siberia, there was often dissension between these two centers of the Russian power on the steppe. This was no exception. Um, General Dugamil um, says that he disagrees with General Bizak, that this is um, uh, uh, um, chasing after shadows, that it's not a good, and he continues to oppose it actually right up until 1865. Um, but um, Bezak does manage to convince Milutin, um, who is the Russian war minister, that this is a good idea. Uh, and in 1863, the Russian uh, advance resumes. Um, this is another of those sort of um, complex tales that I can't go into in, in, in too much detail. One important point is that the Russians had a very shaky knowledge of the geography of this particular region. So this sketch map here, which comes from the Kazakh archives, one of my favorite documents from there, drawn up by one of the Kazakh scouts, um, shows the region between um, uh, Tashkent and Turkestan. So Tashkent is here, Chimkent is here, uh, Turkestan is up here, Auliata, modern Taraz, is here, and you have the the line of the Karatar Mountains um, running in between. Um, and this seems to be the sort of the, the sum total of, of Russian knowledge of this region. So 
their plan, which was originally to run um, their new frontier along the summit of the Karatau here, uh, founders simply because they are not sufficiently well acquainted with the, um, with the landscape. Um, so there's no water in this region. The only road that links together Turkestan Aliata actually runs down here through Chimkent. Uh, and for those reasons, um, General Chenyaev ends up um, taking a lot more territory than had originally been um, envisaged. So um, those campaigns then, um, here we see Pirovsky in 1853, uh, General Debu, who destroys the Kokandi fortress of, of Yangi Kurgan uh, in 1861. Um, then uh, Julek um, is taken. Chenyaev takes the town of Suzak in 1863. By 1864, he's moved to the Siberian command and he um, captures uh, Aulia Atar. General Viryovkin uh, takes the town of Turkestan. Chenyaev then captures uh, Chimkent, uh, also in 1864, and then finally Tashkent in 1865. Um, and the Russians again are engaging in an attempted, sorry, this is just a contemporary photograph of, of Turkestan to give you a, a flavor of what it looked like um, at that time, um, showing the great um, mausoleum of Hoja Ahmad Yasavi um, there. So this map illustrates where the Russians are sort of trying to draw a frontier in this region. First, they start with the Karatau Mountains, that's the line in red. Then they try to draw a frontier along the river Aris, but they discover A, it's too shallow, and B, Chimkent is on the wrong side of it, which was something they didn't realize. <laughs> they thought the Chimkent lay to the north of the Aris. Um, then they decide to put it through Chimkent, but that doesn't work either. Then briefly, they think they'll run it through a place called Sharabhana, which literally means, well, pub, basically, alcohol house. Uh, and then eventually, um, uh, they, uh, eventually Chenyaev captures um, Tashkent. Um, my argument would be that Chenyaev probably, he helps to accelerate the timetable of the Russian advance into this region. He doesn't really change its overall direction. This is something that um, ultimately would have happened anyway, uh, and was indeed controlled from St. Petersburg. Um, Moving swiftly on to my next example, um, because I'm aware that uh, I've only got about 15 or 20 minutes left. So yes, this is a contemporary map of Tashkent um, when it fell. Um, talking about the Hever expedition of 1873, so this is when Hever does finally fall um, to Russian arms. Um, and we see very, very sort of similar uh, language, similar themes, similar attitudes coming to the fore as we did um, 30 years earlier when Pirovsky was first contemplating uh, an expedition against Kiva. Um, this is a report from the commander of the Mangishlak division up on the Caspian in 1872. Um, uh, the character of Asiatic rulers is everywhere the same. When the danger is near, they're willing to engage in any kind of trade-off. Let the danger diminish and they will seek to deflect all unpleasant events to the last degree, employing for this purpose the usual in these circumstances, deceit, resourcefulness and distrust. It's for this reason that in place of the speedy freeing of our unhappy prisoners, prisoners from the most mighty power in the world, again we see that sense of affront, how dare the heathens defy us in this way. We see them tormented already for some years in captivity, in insignificant Nishtoznyeshi um, Hiva. Now, um, the advance on Hever in 1873 is sometimes, it's been argued, was a response to the Granville Gorchakov um, agreement of uh, January 1873, uh, which, had agreed, which had sort of um, agreed on a broad territorial division in Central Asia. Um, that actually, so that's the argument made by Evgeny Sergeyev in his book on the Great Game, but it's clearly wrong because, in fact, um, the, um, the decision to attack Hever had already been made in the autumn of 1872. Once again, you have this very long run in time for Russian expeditions. They don't happen immediately because you need to round up the camels. Um, the other argument that is sometimes made is that Hiva was simply particularly intransigent, that the heathens were refusing to make peace or to give in to Russian demands. I found that simply wasn't true. That the heathens made repeated attempts uh, to try to forestall the Russian advance. They were well aware that the Russians posed a danger to them. Um, and all of these were rebuffed and they were rebuffed um, mainly because um, uh, General von Kaufmann, uh, the governor general of Turkestan, was absolutely determined to have the Kievan triumph for himself. So this, this is a quotation from um, this very long diplomatic exchange that takes place. Um, the Kievans attempt to make contact with the Caucasian command of the Russian Empire because they're not getting any joy from von Kaufmann. Um, 
this is um, from the testimony of Nur Muhammad, who was uh, a Nishan, that is a Muslim spiritual leader from the Mangishlat Peninsula, who is used as a go-between between the Russians and the heathens. Um, and um, he's recounting what he told the heathen Khan, uh, Muhammad Rahim II. Um, after this, the Khan asked me, is it true that the Russian forces have come in our direction? And I said, it's true. The Khan then said to me, you are an old man, experienced, tell me, what do you think about this? I replied, the Russian forces are surprisingly strong and powerful, like an angry lion, and no one can stand against them. I would propose that for you it would be best if you made peace in this matter. The Khan replied, I also think so, but I don't know if the Russians will take my envoy, even if I send to them the most peaceful and friendly proposals. I said, it seems to me that His Majesty the Emperor will not refuse your kind proposals. Um, well, in fact, um, his proposals never got as far as the Emperor, partly because von Kaufmann insisted on maintaining monopoly on all diplomatic contact with Hiva. Um, so none of the heathen ambassadors were allowed to proceed further than Tashkent or, or Orenburg. Um, and it was, it's very, very clear as you go through the correspondence surrounding this that the Russians are not actually interested in negotiating. So at one point, at one point they um, impose a list of 81 conditions <laughs> on the heathens in return for which they might refrain from attacking them. Um, and this is not something that you do if you're actually serious um, about negotiating, particularly as they weren't offering anything um, um, in return. Um, the truth then is that um, von Kaufmann, pictured here, um, was very anxious to have the glory of the capture of Kiva for himself, um, partly because of a long-standing rivalry with his predecessor Chenyaev, whom he hated, um, partly because Kiva for the Russians is really the it's a sort of symbol of Central Asian defiance because of Pirovsky's failure, because of the failure of Bekovich Cherkaski under Peter the Great, who had tried to um, uh, attack Hiva in 1717. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is a particularly sort of symbolic triumph. Um, but again, it's not that this is unauthorized. Von Kaufmann um, is very close to Dmitry Milutin, the war minister. He's one of his sort of chosen officers, he gets everything he asks for when he goes to St. Petersburg with this proposal. Um, and it's a particularly elaborate plan of conquest. So you can see this, this schematic map here shows um, that they're attacking uh, from four different points. Um, there's a column from Tashkent, another from Orenburg, another from Mangishlak or from the Kindeli uh, Inlet, and another from Chikishlar uh, down on the Caspian coast. Um, this map shows um, this in slightly less schematic form and actually shows it in a little bit more detail. So you've actually got um, uh, the column coming from Tashkent actually was in two parts um, um, uh, as well. This column here from Chikishla and from Krasnovodsk never made it. They, they got stuck in the deserts, ran out of water and had to turn back. Um, it was a very expensive expedition. It was really in a way using a sledgehammer to crack a, a nut because um, once they actually got to the heathen oasis um, here, uh, they encountered very little effective resistance. And just one of these columns, probably the one from Orenburg would have been sufficient. Um, so this is a very stage managed campaign and that's reflected uh, in um, uh, some of the sort of subsequent commemoration of it. So this is quite a famous painting by Nikolai Karazin um, who had taken part in some of the earlier campaigns in Turkestan uh, uh, in the 1860s. Again, it shows the centrality of camels to this. This represents a, a moment of crisis uh, on the march of the Turkestan column under von Kaufmann's command uh, when uh, they almost ran out of water um, and um, large numbers of their camels started to die. Um, the, um, the conquest is followed by one of the most notorious um, events um, uh, of the, or episodes of this, this whole, um, um, well, of the episodes of the conquest, which is the massacre of the Yomud Turkmen, um, of which has a very vivid description um, in the works of uh, Januarius Magachan, the um, American journalist who accompanied um, uh, the Russian columns, uh, also accounts in Eugene Schuyler's um, um, book about Turkestan. This, however, is um, uh, uh, a letter which gives some insight into why this massacre happened. Ostensibly, it's because the Yomuds were still defying the Russians, which wasn't actually the case. Um, and Nikolai Lomakin, who was a Caucasian officer, writing to the Viceroy of the Caucasus, Grand Duke Mikhail, um, saying that um, the real reason for this expedition um, uh, it's a, is that it's essential that the 8th Turkestan Company, which has not yet fired a single shot in the course of this expedition, should be given an opportunity to distinguish itself. So 
In other words, there were officers who wanted medals, um, there were careers. Um, this was a campaign that attracted quite a lot of ambitious uh, and well-connected officers from St. Petersburg. Um, again, it gives that sense that this is a campaign in a way that's been fought um, for, uh, fought to sort of fulfill a certain narrative, you might almost say. Um, von Kaufmann also has a series of what we would now call embedded experts with this expedition. So an Orientalist called Alexander Kuhn uh, and a naturalist um, called Bogdanov, who uh, names the Amudaria sturgeon, this um, rather alarming looking creature here, uh, after uh, Kaufmann, Lopatanos Kaufmani. Um, which uh, nowadays is extremely endangered, as you can probably imagine, um, which again gives this sense that this is, um, um, uh, this, is a, this is an expedition that's launched not so much out of military necessity as in order to advance and further von Kaufmann's career, and a lot of publications come out of it. Um, so my, um, my next example is Transcaspia, um, what's now Turkmenistan. Um, I'm not actually going to talk too much about the best known um, element of this campaign, which is, of course, the, the massacre of the Turkmen uh, by General Skobilev at Göktepe. Um, there's actually a long prehistory to that campaign. The Russians have been in Transcaspia since the late 1860s. Uh, there's a series of more or less um, indecisive encounters with the Turkmen over the following decade, uh, culminating in a very humiliating defeat by Russian forces under Lomakin, in fact, um, um, whom we just um, heard from. Uh, at uh, Göktepe um, uh, in 1879. So when Skobilev returns there in 1880, 1881, in a way, he's, it's, he's engaging in revenge for, for, for that earlier humiliation. Uh, but I wanted to talk actually a bit more about the process of border drawing, um, because I think this helps to explain why the Russian advance then does finally come to an end um, in this region. Um, so this is, a, uh, um, this is a map of the region um, which was most contested. It's the region between Merv and Herat um, in Afghanistan. Um, and we have here a quotation um, from a PM Lessar, who had been the, who was quite a well-known um, sort of Russian public servant in this region. He, would, um, um, he had been the Russian agent in Bukhara, amongst other things. And he was attending a meeting of the, of the Royal Geographical Society in London. Um, and his remarks, um, which were given in French, um, were recorded in its journal. Um, and he says, before the fall of Göktepe and even the occupation of Merv, we could have very little knowledge of the claims of Turkomans in these regions. Only quite lately began the surveying of the country. From that time, our maps largely differ from General Walker's. The permanent frontier between Turkomania and Afghanistan ought certainly to be defined according to the mutual rights of both parties, not on the basis of a fancy line drawn on a map previous to the study of the country. Um, the point being that um, Lessar definitely saw this as something that would be possible through mutual agreement. And also actually that it's quite striking that he was there in London when this discussion was, was being made because it emphasizes the fact that um, there is a sort of shared, um, uh, we could call it a shared colonial episteme or shared understanding of what borders should be and how they should be drawn um, between um, the British and the Russians. And of course, this was the first region where there would be a joint um, Russo-British um, Boundary Commission to draw what would become the boundaries between um, uh, Russian territory um, and Afghan territory and Persian territory. Um, and it's a process that was actually satisfied without, um, without uh, any serious disagreement between um, the British and the Russians, although the Afghans were a good deal less happy about it. So this this is a quotation from the Siraj al-Tavarikh, um, sort of standard history of Afghanistan at the time, where the two Afghan um, agents involved in boundary drawing are comp complaining uh, to uh, Amir Abdul Rahman uh, um, Khan saying, Colonel Ridgeway, having decided that he is the final judge and we are only the people who bring provisions and the mere servants of his government, never asks us about anything, neither matters weighty nor trivial, continues to advance the business of delineating the border. When you read accounts of this, it's, it's quite clear that for the British, the priority is basically to get a, get a fixed line to prevent uh, any possibility that the Russians might launch further claims and that they were perfectly prepared to sacrifice uh, Afghan interests in order to do this. So it's really a, per, per, a process of, um, uh, of, of mutual agreement between these two great power rivals, which shuts out um, Central Asian agency um, on the ground. Um, so with the conquest then um, of um, 
Transcaspia, the Russian Empire finally found partners, uh, Britain, Afghanistan, and Persia, with whom it could mutually delineate a hard border in a way that had been impossible with Hiva, with Bukhara, the Turkmen, or the Kazakhs. Um, and that's partly because these were states which the Russians were prepared to recognize as enjoying sovereign rights akin to their own. Um, it was also because the Durrani uh, dynasty in Afghanistan, the Qajar dynasty in Iran, Persia, had begun to assimilate European ideas of borders and sovereignty, uh, supplanting older ideas based on control of a people or resources uh, or roots and areas of blurred, shared or non-existent state sovereignty. So with the conquest of Transcaspia, then almost the last area of vagueness on the Central Asian map is eliminated and only the Pamirs remains. Uh, and the Pamirs are my last case study, um, which I hope I'll have time to get through before, um, 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 before we get to the, the questions. So the Pamirs, um, this is perhaps the, the area of the, the great game, so-called, of Russian expansion, which attracted the most attention um, amongst the British. It's the very last phase of expansion. It's the one where the Russians and the British come closest to each other territorially. Um, it is perhaps a particularly sort of um, uh, remote and wild um, and romantic um, and in general sort of um, uh, um, exciting region which looms large in the European imagination. Um, and this is true on the Russian side as well, to some degree. You have a, a recognizable sort of Pamir cadre of officers who specialize in service in this region. Uh, a couple of the most famous um, are up here, Bronislav Lud Ludwigowicz um, Gromczewski, who is actually Polish, um, uh, and uh, Andrzej Yevgenievich Snesere, um, who was the, um, so Gromczewski was the officer who explored quite a lot of this region for the Russians. Snyesirev was the commander of the Pamir post in the um, um, early 20th century. Um, and this is a region where the Russians take a very particular view of the local population, um, which I've christened sort of mountain Aryanism, basically. And I've got a, a quotation there from uh, Kipling, from the man who would be king, which actually sums up the, the way in which um, Europeans sort of viewed um, the inhabitants, um, uh, uh, certainly the, the sedentary inhabitants of the Pamirs, um, uh, as he says, your, your white people, sons of Alexander, not like common black Mohammedans. Um, and we see very, very similar sort of attitudes on the Russian side. They also have this belief that in the Pamirs, you have the sort of last remnants of the, um, um, the Aryans, so-called, um, uh, of Central Asia, who had been sort of overlaid by successive waves of, of, um, of Turkic or of Mongol invasion. Uh, and driven up into these sort of mountain fastnesses. Um, so here's Snyesirev writing to his sister in 1901. Uh, in the Valley of the Panj, I became acquainted with the Tajiks who turn out to be the most purely preserved Aryans. Many of their words so remind you of ours or German or French words, you're simply astonished. Or A.G. Serebrinikov um, writing um, about the region that the Tajiks of Shugnan, Roshan and Vakhan mean less subject to mixing with peoples of Turco-Mongol blood than other representatives of the Aryan tribes therefore present themselves as members of the Aryan family who have most preserved the purity of type. So that sort of racialized thinking is found on both the British um, and the Russian side. Um, the effect of this is that um, a sort of paternalistic spirit, as we might call it, is much more important in driving the Russians on in this region, this sense that the inhabitants are vulnerable, that they are to some extent sort of kin, that they need to be protected against um, uh, rapacious sort of lowland um, Sunni Muslims um, who are their, their neighbors and who seek to dominate them. So that's a dynamic that you don't really find um, in other stages of the Russian advance. It emphasizes the importance of looking at each of these campaigns, each of these stages uh, um, uh, within its own specific context. Um, so this is a contemporary map of, of Russian explorations. Um, this particular uh, um, expedition is from 1883 uh, under D.V. Kutyata. Um, and um, this is one of the sort of celebrated Russian players of the, the great game in this region, uh, Nikolai Petrovsky, uh, who was the Russian uh, consul in Kashgar, um, complaining here about the, um, the lack of clarity, again, of Russian borders in this region, um, and um, the, um, saying what he thinks is the, legit are the legitimate limits of British control um, there. Um, Gromchevsky, um, uh, explored much of this region for the Russians. He was in constant contact with Petrovsky. Uh, 
in Kashgar reporting on his, um, on his uh, movements. Um, I particularly like this quotation, uh, which is why I threw it in here. You already know how many difficulties and losses we have endured on this route. There is no need to describe it to you. I will only say that if Dante had come to Kanjut, then the description of the route would be more characteristic and have greater verisimilitude. Um, so the Russians make the decision to annex um, this region in 1892, um, after having sent a couple of military expeditions there. Um, so um, um, the way they justify this is basically as a protective measure, uh, a useful portion of our territory is a protective position for the maintenance of calm and safety of the Turkestan region, that it is not possible to yield it to other governments. So to some extent, it's a sort of, it's a negative decision, if you like. They're well aware that this is a remote uh, and elevated region where, which has few resources, which is very difficult to access, um, uh, but they don't want it falling into anybody else's um, hands. Um, it is essential to take active measures to confirm our influence and power within the boundaries of this region. Uh, for this purpose, we must occupy the most important points amongst the most insignificant of which are the Bazai Gambaz Depression and Akatash. In fact, they don't end up occupying the Bazai Gambaz Depression that ends up in the the Wakhan Corridor um, in Afghanistan instead, but otherwise, um, broadly speaking, um, this is the program that they carry out. Um, so the post which they establish um, at what's now called Murgab um, in, uh, um, uh, in Tajikistan in the Gorna Badakhshan Autonomous Oblast, this is a contemporary photograph from Haydn's account. Um, uh, another one here, um, this is next to the river Murgab. Um, so what we find, um, the Russians do end up, um, there's very little violence actually in the annexation of the Pamirs. There's one very minor clash uh, with um, a group of um, Afghan soldiers. Um, the region had come under Afghan occupation in the, in the 1880s and the Russians were anxious to drive them out. Um, we see here um, the account from Colonel Yonov um, of this clash in 1892, um, describing how the Afghan, that is Captain Ghulam Haider Khan, uh, bore himself insolently, Gierska, provokingly, and to my proposal to lay down their weapons and withdraw, he gave the response, they would give up their weapons with their lives. Um, and um, this, then led to, uh, this then led to a violent um, clash. Um, we see here in this document um, from uh, um, Yonov's successor, Colonel Zaitse, um, his response to the frequent pleas from the local inhabitants that they should be brought under Russian protection, um, basically to keep the Afghans out. Um, and um, this is very, very characteristic of the correspondence that you find um, from this region where um, Russian officers are constantly saying, look, you know, the local inhabitants want us here, they want us to um, uh, uh, come in and keep the Afghans out. Um, they often enclose petitions written by the local population. Um, and that might seem like, um, uh, I suppose, a form of, uh, of special pleading, um, but actually there are quite good reasons why the inhabitants um, of the Western Pamirs in particular might well have preferred Russian rule, certainly to Afghan rule, um, the main one being religious. Um, because of course the re inhabitants of this region were mainly Ismaili. They were indeed persecuted by the Afghans. In fact, they were often enslaved by them. Um, and um, as here Count Bobrinskoy, who wrote a very well-known account of the Ismailis um, at this time, writes, we should not be surprised that the Highlanders are well disposed towards the Russians. They calculate they will find in the Russians patrons of their sects and support in their senseless but hard and constant struggle with Sunnism. Um, so the British response, actually, um, once the Russians moved decisively into this, and, and this is, of course, the response from... Um, uh, um, Francis' young husband, who had been rather unceremoniously um, sort of kicked out of the Pamirs in 1892 when he ran across um, uh, Yonov's um, expedition. Um, it's actually quite, he responds with a degree of equanimity. Um, I won't read all of this out because I'm aware we're coming to the end of our time, but he says, I don't think it need trouble us very much. Uh, the Russians are drawn on in much the same way as we are, mainly, I think, by frontier officers. Um, and um, you know, he, he goes on to say that uh, a forward policy seems the most manly and even the most prudent to anticipate the designs of the other uh, a forward move is suggested and carried out. Uh, and this is reflected in the relative ease, once again, 
uh, with which the Pamir boundary is settled, um, um, in generally speaking, in a spirit of, of amicable cooperation, but one, of course, which once again excludes local actors. So the, the Chinese, who have some stake in this, in this region, the Afghans and the local population are not really included in this process. It's something that's very much agreed between the, um, uh, the two great powers. Um, and then the territorial, so these are the details of the territorial settlement. Um, so uh, Darvaz, Shugnan, Roshan and Bahan, beyond the Panj are ceded to Afghanistan. In compensation for the loss of part of Darvaz, the Amir Bukhara gets Shugnan, Roshan and Bahan, um, uh, and the Russians establish a, a garrison at Horog. Um, but there aren't really any actual serious disagreements um, um, over this. Um, so I'll run through a few conclusions. There are obviously a lot more um, um, things I could say. Um, so the quest for a firm state boundary, and this is a term they use a lot, um, is the ostensible goal of most Russian campaigns in Central Asia between the 1840s and the 1890s. Um, so in nomadic territories, when confronted by non-Bestphalian states with fuzzy external boundaries, such as Kokand, this translates into near constant further expansion. Um, and they often believe that a natural frontier, you know, a watershed or a river, would somehow present itself in the landscape. Um, in practice, that gives enormous latitude to commanders on the spot. Um, but border making for the Russians becomes much, much simpler uh, when it was with, with states that had similar ideas of territorial sovereignty. So whether that's Qing China, uh, the Qajar state in Iran, uh, or the British Indian state. Um, and I would argue that our obsession with the so-called great game has blinded us to how quickly and amicably borders would in fact be drawn in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, often by a mutual agreement between the Russians and the British that excluded uh, local actors and was founded on their common understanding of the imperial enterprise. And in the end, the Britons, British and the Russians had far more in common with each other uh, than they did with the peoples that they were conquering and ruling in this region. Uh, and for the Russians, I would say Britain was much more important as an example to emulate uh, than it was as a hostile rival. So I will stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic. And I mean, uh, the thought occurred to me that um, the name of the great game um, uh, has an aspect to it that we don't tend to think about very much, but that is games have rules. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the picture that you present, uh, at least as far as Russia and Britain is concerned, it is something where people, broadly speaking, do understand the rules around what they're doing. It is, it is, it is not a, an uncontrolled sort of process. Um, but um, let, me, let me turn straight away. We've had quite a lot of questions in, and I, I'd like to, uh, to start uh, with uh, one or two that were emailed in, mm -hmm. in advance. Um, and going back to, to Kiva, um, uh, Arma Connick asks, uh, Kiva allegedly requested inclusion in the British Empire um, as a way of staving off uh, the uh, Russian advance. Um, is there any truth in it? Um, well, uh, the Kievans at different points um, did send um, envoys to, to, to India and actually also to, to the Ottomans. So they did this in the 18... They did this in the 1840s and they were threatened by Russia. They did it again in the run-up to the um, uh, invasion in 1873. Um, uh, whether they were request, they weren't necessarily requesting inclusion of the British Empire, but they were certainly requesting diplomatically, uh, diplomatic and military support. Um, and they got a very dusty answer, both from the British um, and from the Ottomans, um, in the sense that it was simply considered to be the Ottomans actually advised them to make peace with Russia. Um, and um, the British did something very similar on both occasions. They said, we're certainly not going to be able to send you um, um, direct assistance. So, um, as, I mean, there's a detailed account of, um, uh, in the 1840s, they did at least, or rather in the 1830s, they did at least send uh, an envoy there. They sent Captain James Abbott. Um, well, in fact, they sent two envoys. The other was, was Richmond Shakespeare. So we have a pretty detailed account in their, in their, um, their sort of travelogues. Um, of their negotiations, but it's very clear that Abbott wasn't really authorized to offer anything. You know, the heathens want, um, they want artillery above all, and they want people who know how to handle it. And this, this the British are simply not prepared to give them. Um, so um, it is true, certainly, that, that Heaver maintained um, external diplomatic relations, but um, um, 
the British are basically pretty, they're pretty clueless about Central Asia. I mean, I've done quite a lot of work in the National Archives of India as well, looking at what they knew about it. And um, uh, a lot of the time, um, they're really sort of, um, they're sort of, they're really in the dark. So there's a, there's, a, there's an embassy from Kokand um, in 1854, in the aftermath of the fall of Akhmar's Jid. Um, and um, they get some slightly more accurate um, information from that um, about the situation in, in, in Central Asia. Um, but a lot of the time they, they simply don't know what's happening. And, and very often, in fact, they get the news of Russian advances in Central Asia via London. You know, so the, the embassy, the, 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 the Russian embassy notifies London that they've done this. And only then does the, the message get through to India. Um, their, their, their intelligence is actually not terribly good. At least that's, that's certainly my experience. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sticking um, uh, in, in this sort of area for, for a little bit, Sir David Dane, a former uh, diplomat and much involved with Afghanistan among other countries during his career, asks, would the Russians have sought to extend their empire to Afghanistan if the British had not been determined to keep it a buffer state? Hmm. He says, I've found it impossible to judge the answer to this question from the diplomatic and military behaviour of the Russians. But I wonder if there might be documentary evidence. There is a lot of documentary evidence. I mean, some of it is contradictory. There, there, is, a, there is a school of thought, particularly amongst um, Russian officers, which wanted their southern frontier to be anchored on the Hindu Kush. So they wanted to annex what is now northern Afghanistan, Afghan Turkestan. Uh, and that was because of this idea that the Hindu Kush formed a kind of natural frontier in a way that the, the Amu Darya um, did not. Uh, and so certainly the fact that that, um, you know, that the British had kittens every time the Russians went anywhere near Herat um, certainly did sort of help to keep them out in that sense. Um, but the, the Russians are, they're prone to sort of... Um, in their relations with Afghanistan, I think it's sometimes a mirror image, actually, of how the British um, approach it, um, in the sense that um, they tend to overestimate um, the degree of British control and influence there. So, for instance, um, in the clash which happens between Afghan and Russian troops at Panjdeh in 1885, which, which does prompt a diplomatic crisis, um, the Russians assume that the Afghans would not have dared to attack or resist them if they didn't have British backing. But actually, we know from British sources that they were doing everything they could to rein the Afghans in. Um, so again, we need to actually think seriously about Central Asian agency um, here, not just assume that it's only the great powers that can do anything. And I, I have a, quite a long um, article about the, um, the Russian involvement in the Second Anglo-Afghan War, um, which is often seen as, um, again, you'll find in a lot of the existing historiography, this idea that the Russians sort of cunningly tricked um, the British into intervening in Afghanistan in 1878, knowing that it would, become, it would be a disaster, you know, that their, their mission would get massacred in Kabul um, and that, um, um, you know, it would, it would end up being an enormously costly error. But actually, of course, you know, the Russians didn't have powers of clairvoyance and they had no idea that any of this was going to happen. The, um, uh, they sent an embassy to Afghanistan in 1878, um, actually for, for different reasons, to try and persuade, to warn or reassure the Amir that um, some troop movements that they were carrying out in Central Asia were not aimed at him, but were aimed at alarming the British instead. Um, the British paid no attention to the troop movements, but they saw the, em the embassy as um, a deliberate provocation, and it prompted them to invade. And the Russians thought this was a catastrophe. You know, God, we've overplayed our hands to a terrible degree here. You know, now we're going to be shut out of Afghanistan permanently. The British will become paramount there. Um, except, of course, that doesn't happen because um, Kavanyari and his mission get, get massacred and then there's a, a further, uh, there's a further war. Um, and by um, 1880, the British are sort of tearing their hair out thinking, what do we do? You know, we, we don't want to stay here. We've got to find somebody to take over. And that's when Abdurrahman pops up. And the British think he's a Russian client because he's been, um, uh, he's been uh, um, living in Samarkand under Russian protection for the previous decade or so. Um, and, but they don't see any alternative. He seems to be the only person with sufficient ruthlessness um, to actually be able to, to manage the Afghan state for them. Um, and so they, they acquiesce. Meanwhile, um, the Russians actually think that Abdul Rahman is working for the British. And the truth is, of course, he wasn't working for either. He was working for himself. Um, and uh, we need, again, to 
you know, he wasn't, <laughs> Abdul Rahman Khan wasn't a terribly nice man in all sorts of ways, but he was a very ruthless and effective politician. He was the man who really built the modern Afghan state um, using British subsidies in order to do so and, and playing the Russians and the British off against each other very skillfully. So I think this is actually an object lesson in, in not assuming that it's only the great powers that actually have any, any agency. Um, well, just um, staying uh, for a moment with a great power, albeit not uh, one militarily engaged here, um, uh, we have a, a, a question um, uh, from, uh, from an anonymous questioner um, who asks, by framing the myth of the great game as being a competition between Imperial Britain and Russia, mm. how much do we ignore the third triangulation of Imperial Germany? whose soft power approach to influence in Central and Eastern Asia may have proved more successful mm. long term. Mm. Well, I, the, the real expert on this question is, is Professor Rudolf Mark um, um, from the, the Bundeswehr University in Hamburg, who's, who's recently retired, but who has a, a large monograph on the topic. Um, I mean, from my reading of his work, um, I think the German role is, is actually surprisingly often um, as a sort of peacemaker between the two. So Bismarck actually helps to settle the dispute in, in, in 1885 because he doesn't want a war um, um, between Britain and Russia. Um, German influence in the region is mainly commercial. Um, so um, for instance, the, um, the trade in Karakul wool, uh, so in Astrakhan, you know, the, the, the sheep, Astrakhan sheepskins as they're called, but they actually come mainly from Bukhara, um, is mainly in the hands of um, German traders from Leipzig. Um, so an awful lot of um, uh, Central Asian sort of um, exports eventually sort of flow um, flow there, um, and there are representatives of some sort of German commercial firms in the region as well. That said, I mean, the German. I mean, it's it, there is this idea, for instance, that the Germans had agents in Central Asia during the First World War that they played a role, even played a role in the um, the 1916 revolt against the Russian Empire um, in that period. There, there's simply no evidence for this. Um, those who've done work in the, um, uh, in the German foreign ministry archives have found that um, the Germans simply didn't really know what was going on there at that time. They started to take more active interest um, after, the, um, after the Bolshevik Revolution, um, but um, certainly um, prior to that point, um, they didn't really have any sort of um, direct agents um, um, working for them there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the... Um, I think the German approach was certainly very effective within the Ottoman Empire, although ultimately the Ottomans turned out to be more of a liability than, uh, um, than an asset um, for the Germans during the First World War. In Central Asia, um, I would say their, their, sort of, their ability to sort of apply direct military or, or political pressure is quite limited um, and is mainly, where it exists, it's mainly to do with the relations that they have with, with Britain and Russia in Europe, as it were, rather than any influence they have there on the ground. But, but as I say, that's, that's, I would read, I would read Professor Mark's book on that, on that topic, probably. Um. Splendid. Um, thank you. A, a question from Adam Osterfield, taking us in, in the, the direction of, of, really of internal Russian politics, I suppose. He asks, what was the relationship between domestic, social and economic transformation in Russia at the time in the mid 19th century, freeing serfs, for example, mm. and a more imperial near border expansion. I don't think there's a very direct connection. Um, and I think that's partly because this is a, this is really an enterprise of Russia's sort of bureaucratic military ruling class. So it's very important to them. Um, it doesn't become important really for the majority of Russians, probably until the 1890s, when you start to see um, growing waves of peasant settlement going into the region. Um, so I think the, um, um, the connection with sort of broader developments in Russian history is more to do with, um, again, with ideas of prestige. Um, so one reason that the, um, the advance into Central Asia resumes um, in the early 1860s um, is because this is seen as a region where it will be possible to get some um, fairly cheap military triumphs to sort of offset some of the humiliations of the Crimean War. Um, so in, in, within the institutional culture then of the Russian army, I would argue the conquest of Central Asia is very important. Within Russian society as a whole, 
much less so. Um, one of the things I've often puzzled over, actually, for instance, is that so the conquest of the Caucasus uh, in the 1820s, 30s, 40s produces this extraordinary, um, um, uh, extraordinary range of works um, by some of Russia's greatest authors. Um, it plays a very important role in the Russian Romantic imagination. You have Pushkin, Bestrzev, Marlinsky, Tolstoy, Lermontov, they all write about the Caucasus. Um, and it continues to play, have that very important role for Russians to this day. Central Asia just isn't as glamorous. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have that same impact. Um, and I think there are some explanations for that. One is that it simply takes place later. So, you know, that, that space for the Orient, for the exotic is already occupied in the Russian mind by the Caucasus. Uh, also, the golden age of Russian literature is basically over by the time they penetrate, certainly into the settled regions of Central Asia. Um, and perhaps another reason is the Caucasus is more accessible. Um, it's surrounded by, you know, watering, um, uh, um, fashionable watering places, whereas um, Central Asia is a good deal more remote and a good deal less um, appealing. Um, but um, in terms of the um, in terms of the population as a whole, it just it just it just doesn't really figure. It's it's very absent um, from the um, from the imagination even of most of Russia's educated classes, let alone um, you know the urban working class or, or, or the peasantry. Only I would say with the beginning of mass migration of peasants into Asiatic Russia in the 1890s, many of them heading to Central Asia, does it does it start to play a more important role? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take a couple more questions um, uh, bef before we close. Um, Carolyn Brown, uh, who I think you know was the British ambassador in Kazakhstan until a year or so ago, um, asked, um, what attitude did you find amongst the younger Kazakhstanis today towards this period of history? Do they see it as an invasion and occupation now ended? Or is there a more complex attitude in contemporary opinion? It varies a lot. Um, I, mean, I would say it certainly varies, I think, between Russian speakers and Kazakh speakers. Um, Russian speakers are probably more inclined to take a, a kind of, I suppose, a softer attitude towards this, to see it as um, a process of long-standing cultural contact, which then eventually grows into a, a more dominant political relationship on the Russian side. Um, Kazakh speakers would see it certainly as a, as a more violent um, process of conquest and one which has had much more um, sort of long-lasting and sort of damaging effects um, on Kazakh culture. Um, I mean, amongst my students when I taught there, um, it's, it's curious because actually the, the old Soviet narrative that this was all the process of pre Sadinia is still quite present in Kazakhstan. And one reason for that is that um, uh, is that there is perhaps something some, seen as something sort of a bit humiliating in sort of seeing, saying that you were conquered, you know, that there was a process of subjugation, a process of colonialism. Um, some people say that there was and they are angry about it, and some people say that there was and they accept it, and some people would rather pretend that, it, that there wasn't and that it was a much more equal um, relationship, which in the Soviet period to some extent it did become. I mean, that's a, another topic in a way, but in the Tsarist period, it's not really. I mean, um, um, Central Asia is a colony um, of the Russian Empire, um, and there are various sort of structural ways in which that is expressed, whether it's through the, the absence of the self-governing institutions that you have in European Russia, or the preemptive right that Russian settlers have to, to Kazakh and Kyrgyz land um, in particular. Um, so yes, I, I found quite a lot of sort of varied, um, um, varied attitudes upon that, on that point. Um, what I sort of tried to stress was that, you know, it's, it's, it is part of a much wider phenomenon of European expansion, um, which um, um, happened across the world in the 19th century, um, that, um, you know, Kazakhs did have agency in this process. Many of them actually fought on the Russian side. This is the other complexity here, is that um, the Russians would never have been able to conquer Central Asia without Kazakh cooperation. They needed them as guides. They needed them to manage and breed their camels. Uh, and in many cases, they used them as auxiliary troops. You have other Kazakhs who were serving uh, the Khanate of Kokan. So you have Kazakhs fighting Kazakhs. Um, um, it's very difficult to actually compress this into a standard nationalist narrative either. Um, I would say, though quite a lot of people in modern Kazakhstan um, do that. Um, 
the other sort of sticking point is really this this knotty question of gosudarstvanas of statehood which um blew up whilst i was working in kazakhstan because of president putin's 2014 address in which he said that there had been no statehood in kazakhstan until nazarbayev created it which did not go down well as you probably remember um and um the problem here is that of course um that word statehood comprises a number of um uh, can comprise a number of different meanings um it is generally understood in modern Russian as meaning what we think of as a Westphalian state, as a state which is centralized, which has a taxation system, it has a legal system, it has clear borders, um, uh, um, its sovereignty is bounded and absolute and indivisible. Um, and um, the Kazakhs do indeed have states prior to the 19th century, but they're not this type of state, they're nomadic states. Nomadic states function in a very different way um, because of the, uh, well, because of the economic structure of nomadic society where basically wealth is held as animals and not as land, when you can move animals around, creating centralized power structures is really difficult. So the, the problem you have in Kazakhstan then is that people imagine the, that there was a unitary Kazakh Khanate, that this basically endured until the end of the 18th or beginning of the 19th century. Many would say Kenesari, the Kazakh leader who resisted the Russians in the 1830s and 40s was the last Khan. Um, this is then briefly sort of subjugated by the Russians, and then it re-emerges as the Kazakh Soviet Republic in the 1930s. But this is really completely anachronistic. Um, um, the, the forms of statehood that you have in, amongst the Kazakhs uh, prior to the Russian conquest are very different from those which you have in the Soviet period. And it's that, it's that very difference, I would argue, that actually prompts the Russians to invade, um, because they, they find dealing with that form of sort of fuzzy, amorphous, nomadic sovereignty, very, very frustrating. Fascinating. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to, um, I've got a last question that um, does seem to, um, uh, to derive some of its inspiration from contemporary events. William Crawley asks, to what extent did the Russians commemorate their conquests by putting up statues and what has been the attitude of contemporary Central Asian people towards removing or preserving them? Ah, well, <laughs> I actually have a, um, I've, 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 I have a long piece, um, an article about this, precisely this topic, but it's unpublished as yet. But um, the Russians did indeed commemorate um, various stages of the conquest. Um, uh, almost none of these memorials still survive. They were mostly destroyed by the, by the Bolsheviks. Um, so there's a few exceptions so there's a the memorial to the battle of Uzunagach, which is near almaty is still there um there's a memorial to the explorer nikolai Pozhovalsky, which is still there at the eastern end of, of lake isikul in, in what's now called karakol but by and large um the bolsheviks did a pretty quick clean sweep of things like the the memorial to the battle of ikan or the memorial to von kaufmann in the center of, 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 um, of tashkent um so I have actually, um, um, you can reconstruct what they look like and there are, there are contemporary descriptions and so on, but, um, but this is not really, it, it's a little bit, they get rid of it partly because the Bolsheviks at least claim to be anti-colonial, but it's much more about the Bolshevik uh, attitude that you need to have complete ideological control over public spaces and you can't allow reminders of earlier forms of political legitimacy to survive. There are a few exceptions, of course. They leave, for instance, the bronze horseman standing in St. Petersburg because they see it as having some artistic merit, but by and large, they do a pretty clean sweep. This is why one of the very few statues of Alexander II you will find anywhere uh, today stands in Helsinki, <laughs> not, in, not, in, not anywhere in Russia. Um, and I have to say, I think it speaks rather well for the Finns that they chose to preserve it, um, um, even after they became independent. Um, you know, so my view is that, um, you know, it's an awful lot better if you have a kind of palimpsest um, within the urban landscape where memorials from different periods can accumulate uh, um, alongside each other and you can get a real sense of historical evolution. There have to be some exceptions. I don't think any of us would be very comfortable with, with statues of Hitler or Stalin, because not least because they would become the object of modern political cults. Um, and Soviet monuments, the preservation of Soviet era monuments in Central Asia has been much uh, it's, it's been less consistent. So actually quite a lot of those do survive. Uh, Hujan in northern Tajikistan, which was called Leninabad in the Soviet period, still has its Lenin. Um, and um, because, you know, people still sort of rather like it. They, 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 they like that reminder of the city's past. So they have a statue of Ismail Somoni, who is the new Tajik hero, but they have a statue of Lenin as well. He's just a little bit lower down. Um, elsewhere, 
there's been a bit more of a clear, clean sweep. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan tend to have more Soviet monuments than Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan do. I don't know about Turkmenistan, I haven't, I haven't been there, but I suspect given the nature of Turkmenbashi's regime, there's not very many of them. Um, but for instance, nobody would, would um, consider tearing down Soviet era war memorials anywhere uh, in, in Kazakhstan, um, or indeed, um, I think in any of the other republics. Um, they have a sort of sacredness all of their own, um, I would say. Um, I noticed there's also um, a question from my friend Bijan Omrani um, here, which we perhaps don't have time to answer. But um, I do have, uh, what I can do is, Bijan, I, can, I, could, I have an article which covers the question that you're the question that you're asking about the siege of Herat, which I can send to you, um, uh, um, and which will hopefully sort of partly answer that. Um, uh, thank you. I think B B Bijan will be very happy with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, right. We we are out of time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm to thank you um, to all of our audience. It's clear the discussion could have gone on for much longer, and I, I apologise to those whose questions are cut off by the bell. Um, Particular thanks are due, obviously, to Alexander Morrison for a fascinating talk and a reminder that thud and blunder generally offer better explanations of what happens in the world than cunning plans. <laughs> um, uh, next week, we have Dr. Rudra Chowdhury, director of Carnegie India, talking about his analysis of cross-border clashes between India and Pakistan. Uh, this talk was originally scheduled for July last year, but unfortunately had to be postponed. And I'm very pleased that we are able uh, to bring it to you now. But until then, thank you to Alexander Morrison. Thank you to all of you who have joined us online. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Right. Well, Bye. thank you very much indeed for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.